It's 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, and you know what that means. We finally got the tech working, and hopefully you guys can see me on Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Am I there? <laughs> I can't tell if I'm there. There I am. Okay, that's so weird. All the settings were ready to go. I double-checked everything and have no idea what was going on there. All right. Uh, hello, Darren Fletcher, John Pearson, Ronnie Bear, Spiritual, Dean Turner, Sherry, Marcus Milano. Hey, Sherry. Uh, Peter Ray, Hill Songs from a Headband, Ewart Williams, Kristen Knight, John Dancy. Today, we're going to talk about the 80-20 rule, again, because... One of our regular viewers, Mr. Superblonde, brought it up in the comments, uh, wanted some clarification, had a, uh, a thesis or a hypothesis, never can get those straight, so I want to talk about that. I'm um, going to talk about, let's see, what else? Uh, no, we'll just stick with that. 80-20 rule. So that's what we're going to talk about. Hello, Sinem Burnham, Cass McKenty, Marion Laird, Kristen Knight. Douglas Fuqua, Fuqua. Um, Jan Wilage. Okay, Richard Carr. So, okay. So, regular chatter and viewer. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Andre. Who's bouncing back and forth? Am I? Anyway, uh, so oops, that's not what I need, but this is what I need. All right, so in this gentleman's comments, which uh, were very long but much appreciated, uh, topic number two, he said, 80-20 rule in writing. If 20% of my product will reap 80% of the rewards, then how can I cut away the wasted 80% effort, which yields low reward? How to recognize which opportunities will be the winning 20%? That's a very, very, very intelligent question. Um, okay, so first of all, that is, the 80-20 rule is called the Pareto Principle. I've actually read a couple of books about that, and it's mentioned in many of the marketing books I've read over the years. So let me read you something from the Investopedia website. Um, about real life examples of the 80-20 rule. I'm sure that there's stuff I haven't finished reading this because I had to go live, which I wasn't actually live for some unknown reason. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see, there are a number, okay, so there are a number of practical applications for the 80-20 rule uh, in diverse areas such as the distribution of wealth and economics, quality production control, business sales, and growth. The 80-20 rule was invented by Vilfredo Pareto in Italy in 1906. So this thing's been around for a while. According to the legend, oh, it's just legend, not actual facts. We like facts on this show. Uh, Pareto, an economist, noticed 20% of the pea pods in his garden provided 80% of the peas. Um, he then determined 20% of the population in Italy owned 80% of the land. The use of the 80-20 rule has since expanded beyond the alleged humble beginnings in Pareto's garden. Uh, Dr. Joseph Juren applied the 80-20 rule to, the quality control, to quality control in the 1940s. He found that 80% of the problems uh, with products were caused by 20% of the production defects. Uh, by focusing on and reducing that 20% production defects, overall quality could be increased. Duran became an important figure in Japan after lecturing there extensively on quality control issues. His main phrase was the vital few and the trivial many. Um, I don't think we need to talk about it in business and investments. Let me skim this really quickly and see if there's anything that's apropos. Um, yeah, here, this is. Um, the 80-20 rule can help managers and business owners focus 80% of their time on the 20% of the business yielding the greatest results. Um, I know that all salespeople uh, follow the 80-20 rule. They find that 80% of their income is from 20% uh, of the people 
that you know if they reach out to 100 people 20 of them will be the people most responsible for the greatest amount of income coming in or sales um so i want to go back and, and read super blonde's question one more time the 80 20 rule in writing uh songwriting if 20% of my product, which would be songs or instrumental cues, will reap 80% of the rewards, then how can I cut away the wasted 80% effort, which yields low rewards? How to recognize which opportunities will be the winning 20%. All right. Uh, hello, Greg Carroza. So I have heard numerous times, uh, easily a dozen, maybe a couple of dozen times over the many years that I've been running Taxi uh, from our moderately successful members up to our enormously successful members the many 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 of them have reported to me that much to their own bemusement i believe that might be a correct word there uh they have found that the pareto prince pareto principle does apply there's a mouthful um, and that 80 percent of their income uh, does in fact come from 20% of their musical output, let's call it. So uh, I think the question is well framed. So if that's the case, then what are the key factors? What are the similarities? Because um, then why would you want to create 100 tracks if only 20 of them are the ones that consistently or most consistently keep producing income? Well, I don't know that anybody's actually figured that out, but I'd like to offer some thoughts and see what you guys think about it. So the thing that our members who have told me that uh, the Pareto principle is true for them um, have mentioned that the tracks that seem to earn the most money are surprisingly the ones they had the least amount of faith in. In other words, they had many other tracks that they thought were much better, and ha, 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 the ones that I thought kind of sucked were the ones that produced income. So there's that, and I don't know how to actually qualify or quantify that. Um, the other thing that they found was that almost uniformly, uh, that the simplest tracks were the ones that earned the most income. In some cases, they were more fully developed tracks where they had alt mixes that rather than, you know, full band with uh, strings and horns and whatever other bells and whistles were thrown in there, that when they provided the alt mix, it was just, the, you know, the bass drums and keyboard, let's say. Um, lo and behold, that the stripped down mixes were the ones that almost always got used and kept creating income. I believe, I could be wrong about this, but if memory serves correctly, uh, taxi member Matt Hurt, who was probably our first six-figure earning member and consistently you know, stayed up there for many, many years um, and has contributed to the general knowledge base of many members that came after him. I think it was Matt that told me once that he had some dopey little track, and I don't mean to demean his music, but he, it, it, to him it was kind of laughable that this track that he didn't think was his best work um, averaged something like $9,000 a year in income. And it was, in fact, a stripped down version of it. So how would you eliminate the other 100 tracks or the other 80 tracks? Let's, again, going with the theory that you produce 100 pieces of music and only 20 of them are going to produce uh, the majority of your income. Um, how do you just produce that? that style or, or whatever, what are the, the commonalities? So I would posit that number one, I would look at, I would talk to my fellow members who are successful on the taxi forum and ask them which genres are the most consistent income earners for you. And I would be willing to guess, just a guess, educated guess, but a guess, that people are going to tell you that it's hip-hop um, and dramedy, probably. Um, and we're talking instrumental tracks here. Um, so I, I would go for the genres that have a reputation for being... First of all, you can see which ones are most frequently requested in the taxi listings. So if you see a lot of things that mention hip-hop, maybe a light bulb should go on and you go, huh. Hip-hop, uh, maybe I should be doing hip-hop. 
So then, uh, you know the genre, or maybe a few genres that are more likely. Obviously, a hip hop track is going to get used more often because that's what's happening out in the world and for shows or films that take place in today. You know, like time-wise now this not uh, this year let's say as opposed to 10 years ago 20 years ago um hip-hop is a thing it's common uh, the hip-hop beat has made its way into other genres of music it's here to stay and therefore it gets used a lot in tv shows that want to sound current because that's currently what's happening so rule number one i would say would be produce music Hip hop would be one genre. There might be a couple others like dramedy, and I'm trying, maybe you guys can suggest some. Um, so that's number one. And let's see. Uh, and then strip it down. Um, you know, we, we run listings all the time and we say simple is better. Um, there's one company that we work with that will only sign stuff that is stripped down because they have discovered that secret. So why should they, you know, tie up people's music and go through the trouble of having all that paperwork and storing all that music and plugging all that music if they have consistently found, which they clearly have, that the stripped down versions get placed more often than the stuff that's not stripped down. So number one, pick a genre that you know is hot. Number two, um, and that you can do well. Uh, and number two, um, strip it down. Uh, reject that impulse that's going, oh man, it'd be cool if you added this, or it'd be great if you added one of those. Don't do it. Strip it down. I literally last night was watching TV and her, her I can't remember what it was for, a TV commercial for something that had a percussion only track. At least I thought it was because like the first 20 seconds was percussion only. And it was basically, you know, like some sort of mechanical thing making this percussion. I couldn't even identify what the sounds were. It's not like it was a snare drum or a conga or a shaker or anything that I was that familiar with. Uh, it almost sounded like... Um, Somebody took, a, what do you call it, a, a jack-in-the-box and wound it up and then put tape over the little prongs that make the tones, that make the melody. It sounds like they, they took all but two of the melody-producing prongs out of it and somehow muted or deadened the other ones. I'm sure they did it with a keyboard, you know, in MIDI. But, and it, it just was like... And... I, I was sitting there going, oh man, I can't wait to tell everybody tomorrow on Quarantini about this. Because when we run those listings for percussion tracks, a lot of the tracks that come in, you can tell people tried to win Percussionist of the Year. And that's not what they want. They want something that is either so simple that it doesn't step on dialogue if it's up in the mix, or is so simple that if it's down in the mix that it gives you a sense that it's there because of its beat, but it doesn't get in the way of anything and just kind of fills the vacuum that's there without actually um, being predominant in the mix. So, uh, sorry, I'm catching up on, on a lot of activity going on in the chat room today. Um, Anyway, so those are the two things I would do. Uh, I would look at genre and I would make it simple. So Super Blonde, if you watch the, the uh, archive version of the show tonight, there's your answer. I can't really think of much else. Uh, but you have to make sure whichever one of those popular, often requested genres that you choose to work in is something that you can do well. And man, oh man, just... Strip it down, baby. Start listening to reality TV shows. You will see what I mean. A lot of the music that makes it into those shows, and I'm sure in other places as well, is in fact really simple. Once again, I know I sound like a broken record. They are not looking for the composer of the year. They are looking for the right music to enhance the scene, either the emotion, the vibe, um, and the scene. So there you go. Um, you know, it's a bunch of chatty squirrels. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. 
So that's the answer to that. Super Blonde, thank you for submitting that. I will address these other issues. Oh, let's talk about this one. And if you guys could please pay attention for a second. Um, topic number four from Super Blonde was deadlines and daily listings. If it takes a, a five-year plan of better and better writing to get into libraries, then how can writing, which may be going slow at first, or slow going at first, be written for future expected listings so that the writing may be used for successful submissions later? I'm going to read that one more time because it's a little hard to stand, understand. Um, topic number four, deadlines and daily listings. If it takes a five-year plan of better and better writing to get into libraries, then how can writing which may be slow going at first, be written for future expected listings so the writing may be used for successful submissions later. If writing for current list listings, then the deadline will have already expired by the time something mediocre is ready for a personal listening slash track comparison test. I don't understand that. Um, Presumably, it's important to be able to look ahead in order to not fall behind. Well, Super Blonde, if you're, I, I don't see you in the chat room today. So if you're watching the archive tonight, um, know that I'm not really understanding. This isn't worded all that clearly, but I think what you're saying, and, and clearly between topic number two and topic number four, you're looking for efficiency. Why? Why go through the pain and the developmental arc of your skill set and all that stuff? Um, isn't there a way to derive a faster, more direct path to success? And, and these are intelligent questions, although word, worded a little, not strangely, it's just difficult for me to understand. So in this case, if it takes a five-year plan. Okay, so what, what Super Blonde is referring to, for those of you who may not know, is that the five-year plan, uh, I think was conceived by maybe Matt Hurt, John Mazay, and some of our earlier successful taxi members. Uh, and they talk about how it took them about five years to start becoming successful. So I don't know that it was just that they needed five years to develop their writing skills. It was they needed five years to develop their production skills, five years to be able to learn how to read the listings well, five years to meet other members that could play instruments or collaborate in ways, you know, in areas that they themselves weren't strong in. So the five-year plan is a developmental arc. It's not just about writing, although writing is certainly one of the components of it. But I think that what you're saying is, why wouldn't I just write now and keep those things in a stash for future requests that are in the genre of which you've created music for now, because it sounds like you don't believe that you've got the chops yet to turn stuff around quickly enough to make the deadline. Um, I'm going to ask some of you guys, like uh, maybe Greg Carosa, John Pearson, to weigh in on this in a second. Um, I don't think that you will do as well, Super Blonde, um, by creating tracks today because you can't meet the deadline. And generally speaking, the deadlines are th around three weeks most of the time, not all the time. Um, so honestly, I, I think most of the people that are experienced could bang out like a dramedy cue in a day, maybe a couple of them in, in a day. Uh, but let's say that because you may be new to this and you don't have the experience and the speed yet, the efficiency, um, that maybe it takes you three or four days to cough up one good dramedy track. Well, if you see the listing the day it comes out or shortly thereafter and you've got three weeks, that would certainly give you the time frame to crank out something worth submitting to that listing, right? So I don't think that that's so much of a problem. And you will find that, yes, you could create a bunch of dramedy tracks and keep them in a stash for listings that might be a year or two or three down the road. 
but styles do change. Uh, even with something like dramedy, you know, people got a little burnt out on all the pizzicato and uh, uh, marimba sometimes or glockenspiels, you know. Um, and they've tried, they've started asking for forms of dramedy that might have other instrumentation or have a little twist on it in some way. So I fear that anything you create now might not be stylistically applicable years down the road. So I'm not a fan of that idea of building a stash. Um, let's see what Carosa says. Uh, Carosa says you have to listen to the examples and write like that for each listing. Sometimes an existing track can fit, but you have the best chance by matching the examples. I agree. So yeah, uh, Greg and I are basically saying the same thing, different aspects of the same thing, which is having a stash to submit down the road, probably not going to be fruitful for you. Certainly not going to help your 80-20 rule. Um, yeah, there were parts of that question I just don't understand, but I hope that helps. Anyway, thank you, Super Blonde, for uh, posting those in the comment area. By the way, uh, Giovanni uh, says, I agree. Um, Libby says, questions seem to be about planning ahead, composing towards the future. Well, it is, but you could develop your chops for the future. But again, um, here, you know what? Here's a great example. Um, Deb and I are getting some work done on our kitchen because we had a granite uh, countertop that cracked because some water got underneath, the between the granite and our stainless steel sink the plywood that was underneath and there's a, a little metal thing that separates the plywood from the granite got wet. Some of the silicone sealer caulking around there got old with chlorine in 20 years of age, water got in there. It expanded the plywood, rusted out the metal strip. And when it um, expanded the plywood, it took the granite in that one spot and raised it up almost imperceptibly maybe imperceptibly, uh, maybe it raised it up a 32nd of an inch. Uh, and then when we caught it and we fixed the, the silicone and over time it dried out, well then the little flexing in the granite went away and the granite cracked. And this little hairline crack, which was tolerable, became bigger and bigger and pretty soon chunks of granite were coming out of the countertop. So now we have to replace all the granite in the kitchen at a cost of many thousands of dollars because of that one little mistake. Did the granite installer say, oh, by the way, if you have an undermount sink, make sure you re-silicone it every few years? Nope, they didn't. Um, and, and by the way, since we've had this problem, we've met several friends or, or neighbors that have also had this problem. And all of us got our granite countertops about 20 years ago, so there you go. So in the course of doing this, we're looking at all these different uh, forms of black backsplash material, whether it's tiles or whatever and different forms of um, granite or Caesar stone or whatever to use for the countertops. So think of music kind of like kitchen styles. When we put in this kitchen 20 years ago, having black granite, just like pitch black, solid black granite uh, and kind of like slightly cherry colored mahogany cabinets, um, Look very classy. You'd see it in a lot of magazines and stuff. And now everybody's kitchens are light and bright. You know, white cabinets, um, light countertops, light colored tiles on the backsplash. So styles change. So that makes my point that if you make music, you finally get up to speed. You create a few tracks today, this month, this year. Um, once you become competent at doing a particular style, let's call it dramedy, and then uh, by the time you're ready to pitch it, styles could change. So I agree with Greg Carosa, which is shoot for what's in the listing. You got three weeks, uh, and you will get fast over time. Kristen Knight says, sounds gorgeous. It ain't going to be that anymore, though, Kristen. Um, I think we're going to go with almost like a, we can't go with a white countertop because we're not going to change out the cabinets. I don't want to drop, you know, I don't want this to turn into a $20,000 fix. Um, anyway, uh, oh, it's so funny. I've got two chat rooms going. Wow, this is weird. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, it's like 1300 bucks a slab for granite, and we need two slabs to do it. So there's 2600 bucks right there. Another $3,000 for the cutting of the granite. What do they call it? The fabrication and installation. Another 500 to rip out the old granite. So we're looking at probably before it's all said and done, seven or $8,000 just because somebody should have told us 20 years ago, oh, by the way, if you've got an undermount sink, you should check your silicone caulking every couple of years just to make sure it's still good. But they didn't. Uh, <laughs> this chat room is the best. We'll beat up the other chat room. <laughs> uh, let me go take a look at that other chat room. Yeah, it's the, the same chat. That is so funny. Oh, I've got the same screen open twice. Weird. Anyway, I'm going back to this one because it's all the same people saying the same stuff. Hello, <laughs> good to see you. Okay. The 30 minute link was different than the live link. Yeah, something is going on. I've had this problem twice now in a week or so, and I will talk to Liz and Bria after today's show um, because yeah, something is definitely different. All of my settings were absolutely perfect today and the other day when I had this failure. So something is wrong. So, all right. We have a person who hopefully will never show up in this chat room again, who's been quite a regular for all these months of quarantinis. Um, the gentleman is a, a taxi member. Um, and apparently he saw a listing um, that was listing number S21 O two two O E D, um, and I believe that he might have hired some musicians and he created a piece of music for that listing. Um, and then we put out another listing for the same company that was very similar, but if you read the first sentence of the two listings, one of them asked for, you know, like one, uh, like one of them was retro, I'm making this up, but I'm trying to make a point here. One of them was for like retro R&B with male vocals, let's say, and the other one was for pop R&B with female vocals. So the rest of the listing was virtually identical because it was the same company, all the same, you know, the same circumstances, everything. So the, the gentleman saw the new listing come out. You know, one of them came out, let's say, on a Tuesday. The next one came out on a Wednesday. And this gentleman freaked out. And I'm going to read you what one of our member services people put in our database. Um, he called and asked about listing number, whatever it was, and asked why we would change a listing after it was sent to the members. I told him we do not do that. He said he was working on listing S21022 OED, zero ED, uh, and that we changed it. Um, I said there were a few different listings for the same company. He admitted he got confused. He then asked that I change the deadline from February 20th to March 1st in order for him to hire a singer, etc., to correct his error. I told him I could not do that. Now, I happened to be at the office and I was walking down the hall towards where Liz sits. I was probably 12 to 15 feet away from the doorway of the office she's in and I could hear her getting yelled at. This guy was loud enough that he was coming through the earpiece of the phone and I could hear it from, you know, let's say 12 or 15 feet away. Um, and the person, uh, well, I'll tell you who it was Liz that took the call because I just let the cat out of the bag there. Um, anyway, he she posted in the database. He started to yell and said, I could do it, meaning change the, the deadline date. I just don't want to. I asked that he please stop yelling. Uh, Michael heard me on the phone and asked for this member's number so he could call him directly. Um, I've tried numerous times to explain how the screening process works and that we cannot change deadlines. So yeah, this guy made an error, um, understood that he made an error once he was made aware that there were two similar listings out there. And then he started yelling at Liz because she would not change the deadline, which, I mean, I couldn't change the deadline. 
uh, am I supposed to call a music library owner, a music supervisor up and say, oh, by the way, we have a member that misunderstood. Um, <laughs> is it okay if we send your music to you 10 days later because this guy needs a chance to go in and fix his mistake? No, we can't do that. That would be unprofessional. And, and the answer would be, nope, sorry, the deadline is when I need it. So I called this gentleman up and I said, I heard you yelling at Liz and I'm sorry, but I now understand that, you know, you made a mistake and that you wanted her to change the deadline. She can't do that. And why, you know, you don't, you can't yell at my staff. That's completely and utterly unacceptable. Um, so I need you to call Liz and apologize. And he said, well, I didn't really yell. I just raised my voice and, and spoke, you know, emphatically or something to that effect. He tried to, you know, walk it back a little bit. And I said, I need you to call Liz. So do you know um, that this person actually filed a complaint with the Better Business Bureau and flat out lied in the complaint? I, I said to him, if you don't apologize to Liz, then I don't want to have you as a member of Taxi anymore and I will kick you out and refund your money. He said, no, 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 please don't do that. I said, okay, well, just call her and apologize. You're out of line. So he went on the BBB, filed a complaint, uh, which I don't know, I didn't print it out, but basically the complaint is about a one and a half sentence complaint uh, that says, taxi had an internet problem that they refused to fix. I want my money back. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. You know, I've been doing this for 29 years and we get about three of these people a year that just are insane. Um, <laughs> Cass says, the joy of working with us mentally unstable artists. Uh, keep the fighting <laughs> for the forum. There you go. Anyway, it's just heartbreaking. And, and here's the bummer is that every time somebody files a complaint on the BBB's website, which we get like one complaint a year. I mean, you know, with thousands and thousands of members all over the world, we get like one complaint a year. We have an extremely liberal refund policy, but it doesn't cover stupid mistakes made by the customer that we can't fix for them. And then he just flat out lied, said it was an equipment. He literally said it was an internet equipment problem. I hate people. <laughs> I really, <laughs> uh, Pearson says, that's why I sold my business. Too many idiots. <laughs> uh, so now, you know, even if, I mean, I, I can't in good conscience refund this guy's money. Um, you know, frankly, I, I was prepared to, it's not a matter of pride. It's not a matter of right or wrong, but I can't give, a refund to somebody who lied and his lie isn't even covered in our guarantee our guarantee says if we don't have the best listings best customer service and best something else um let us know within you know you got 365 days to get a money back guarantee um doesn't say anything about you know an internet equipment problem which wasn't the case anyway he lied <laughs> Andre says, can I get a, re a return? I'm, can I return the fly? I didn't catch any fish on it. <laughs> True story. Now that's funny. Uh, Paul Gavin asked, does it make a difference to the libraries when you submit several tracks that are forwarded to a listing? Does it make them want to work with you more? I, I honestly don't know. I, I really don't know, Paul, but I can tell you that it's probably going to kind of guarantees that you're going to hit their radar. Let, let's say, and I'm just pulling a number totally out of thin air here, but let's say, you know, we got 200 submissions for a relatively popular listing and we forwarded 27 pieces of music. And of those 27, four of them were years. Um, the message it's going to send to them, first of all, you're going to get exposed to whoever is doing the ingestion of music on their end um, four times. And it's going to tell them if they think the music is really good, here's a person that can consistently crank, crank out a lot of music in this genre. So that's a plus. Libraries do like people that 
didn't just get lucky with one good thing. They like people that um, can prove that they can do the same thing over and over and over again. So could help you. Um, right, uh, Kristen says, and once you've submitted, no refund. Um, yeah, this guy's asking for, oh, and the guarantee specifically states no refunds on submission fees. And this guy, of course, is asking for $150 worth of submission fees on top of his $300 membership fee. Um, so even if I reply on the BBB website saying this guy is flat out lying, uh, the BBB will not take down the complaint. They, the Better Business Bureau is a scam. I'll flat out say that. I've said that to them on the phone and I am now killing, officially killing our membership there because they will take any complaint. I could have somebody that's never been a taxi member that's not a musician go on the BBB website, file a complaint that's utterly unfounded because they've never been a customer, they've never had a bad experience. Oh, and by the way, this guy who's asking for his money back through the BBB never asked us for his money back just went right to the BBB. So he's basically giving me the, you know what? You called me and said, I should apologize to your employee who I yelled at. Here's what I'm going to do about that, which on the phone, he was very obsequious and, and you know, contrite was going to call Liz and apologize. I think he genuinely felt bad. Uh, but the BBB doesn't vet the complaints. They flat out admit that. So anybody could make a complaint about anything and even if the complaints are unfounded, it still goes against your A or A plus rating. Because if you get like, I don't know, two or three of them in a 12 month period, it knocks you down like from A plus to A or A to A minus or whatever. So yeah, um, there you go. who's looking up the BBB anyway. <laughs> Here's the only place I've heard of it. Yeah, but that might be because you're in Italy or also. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not uncommon in the United States. Um, question, uh, Andre uh, has a question. Always wondered, what if you make a mistake and submit to a wrong listing? Can you correct it before the deadline? Yes, uh, with let me make one caveat, which is sometimes if it's a listing that gets a huge number of submissions, we may start screening a day or two before the deadline just so we can make our delivery date to the industry client. So if your music has already been screened, excuse me, we can't pull it. If it hasn't been screened yet, it should be good to go. Oh, El Rosso's in Denmark, sorry. A country I'd like to go to someday. Uh, our former vice president, uh, he worked at Taxi for 10 or 12 years, a guy named Doug Menick, who he and I are still friends. We still keep in touch. He was married to a lady from Denmark, and they had a lot of Danish friends living in Los Angeles, and I got to meet a bunch of them. I went to Christmas parties at their house where they had candles burning on Christmas trees. I'm sorry, Denmark. I'm sure you're a lovely country with many, many, many very intelligent people in there, but who the hell puts a burning candle on a Christmas tree? That is a recipe for disaster. Other than that, Danes are awesome. Kristen Knight says, yes, I called and asked to withdraw one, and Matt helped so much. Yep, Matt is very, very helpful. Uh, <laughs> Andre says, thank you for that answer about uh, pulling, a list, pulling a submission. I've not done it, but just in case. Um, wow, it's 4.45 already. Wow. <laughs> Ross says, yep, we do that. Not a fan of it either. I know. It's like in America, they, the fire department tells everybody, check your lights before, you know, the little electric lights on the very thin wires that you string in a Christmas tree. Fire departments routinely put the word out, you know, make sure you check all the connections on your lights before you put them up. And, and the, the number of house fires absolutely goes up. I just heard it this year around Christmas time that the number of fires goes up by like 20% or something every year during Christmas time from faulty uh, Christmas tree lights or people leaving them on and leaving the house for a weekend and coming back and finding their house burnt down. So yeah, I, I don't care. If you're standing right next to the tree with a fire extinguisher, 
maybe I would do it, but maybe, you know, why ask for trouble? Uh, or, or use the little, uh, I'm looking around to see if I can spot one here in my house, but I can't. You know those little white tea lights that have like the silicone fake flame and the flickery little LED that you can pick up for like, you know, four for a dollar at, at Michael's art store? Um, yeah, uh, use those instead. Roman candle Christmas tree, absolutely. All right, Nigel says, uh, Michael of person, Nigel, tough now. If a person is considering joining uh, but is at the point where they're not even sure what library genre they'd pursue, how do you recommend that they determine that? Uh, honestly, there's a really good way to, to figure that out, and that is what are your strengths? You know, if you're a singer-songwriter with an acoustic guitar, uh, and that's what you typically do, but you'd now like to do instrumental music, well, if you can play guitar reasonably good, if you're like a B- minus to an A-level player, you know, as long as you know how to tune a guitar and play it in time, um, you could do simple, and I underline the word simple, probably put it in italics, uh, you could do simple, light, breezy, acoustic instrumental tracks. If you're good programming drums and doing MIDI stuff, think about doing uh, hip-hop. Pretty easy, you know, once you understand what makes good hip-hop. Um, so I would say go for a few attempts at creating some test runs uh, of creating uh, instrumental cues and then go on the taxi forum at forums.taxi.com uh, forums with an s and and go to the peer-to-peer -peer section and throw your stuff up and say i'm thinking about becoming a member so i created this hip-hop track um, do you guys think that this would be good enough that i could submit it am i on the path um, and you'll get really honest answers from a bunch of really helpful people. And you could try that in two or three different genres to kind of figure out what you're good at. Um, yes, Andre, I have watched Sound City. It's great. I love it. Um, Sound, Sound City is a, a studio in Van Nuys, I believe. I was there many, many years ago with an old Neve. I, I want to say it was like a Neve 8028. It was pretty old. Um, but just that particular console is legendary and so many famous bands. The studio, I remember the first time I walked in there, I, I you know, came from a world of like these world-class, sexy looking studios with great wood trim and, you know, cool carpeting and awesome wood floors and sexy receptionist desks and just, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. Bells and whistles in the studio. You go to Sound City and the place looked literally like your parents had an empty basement. You're a 13 year old that wanted to invite your friends over. Uh, so they took some linoleum, laid it on the floor, took the old wood paneling on the walls, painted it a color, hung a fluorescent light, put a ping pong table in there so you and your friends could hang out there and play ping pong. It, it's got that kind of vibe. I mean, other the equipment, there's a lot of vintage equipment in there, but the console was special. Um, anyway, uh, great records came out of there. Um, as a matter of fact, as the story goes, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Keith Olson, um, an engineer producer who I used to play golf with like 20 years ago. Um, great reputation, did a bunch of great records. Keith Olson uh, was kind of the house engineer there, or one of the regulars there, and he produced the Buckingham Knicks record there. Uh, Stevie and Lindsay were kind of hangers on, if you will, at that studio and, uh, you know, would sometimes work in other people's sessions and, you know, tidy up and, and run errands and do whatever. And uh, in exchange for doing that, um, they got some studio time and eventually Keith Olsen did their record, I believe, and Mick Fleetwood was looking for a place to cut the next Fleetwood Mac record. And he went there and the, the quarter inch two track that uh, they threw up so that he could hear what the control room sounded like was basically the Buckingham Knicks record. And that's when he said, well, who are these people? I want to meet them. And almost sight unseen, almost, um, hired them to be in Fleetwood Mac, which was 
life-changing for everybody. Um, I know Rupert Neve just passed away the other day, what, 92 or 94 years old or something. Um, there's a man that nobody ever says anything about except for glowing remarks. Everybody loved Rupert Neve. Everybody loves every piece of gear. I don't think any, I've never heard in 45-ish years of being in the business, I've never heard anybody ever say anything bad about, about a piece of gear that Rupert Neve designed, whether it's Focusrite stuff or Neve stuff or the newer Rupert Neve design stuff. Um, wow, he was 94 years old. He did have a good run and was by loved by all, you know. So, I mean, that's pretty sweet when you can uh, live out your years and pass away at a ripe old age knowing that you were uniformly loved and appreciated by an entire industry. Um, David Kanya asks, if you co-write with someone, would both writers need to belong to Taxi? No. You can submit anything that you legitimately wrote or co-wrote. You can't slip one in for a friend. Well, I played guitar on it, or I produced on it, or I was there when they cut it. Nope. If your name wouldn't be on the copyright, you can't submit it. You could have six co-writers. As long as you're officially one of the writers, you can submit it. And that's for legal reasons. It's also for practical business reasons. And here's an example of that. Uh, we do get people that will try and slip stuff in that, you know, sometimes um, a family member, sometimes a close friend, and they go, oh man, your song is perfect for this listing, I'll send it in under my account. And they do, and lo and behold, it lands on the desk of a music supervisor who then presents it to the executive producer on a TV show. And they, the music supervisor gets a thumbs up from the EP, calls up the member and says, hey, Danielle, uh, I heard your song, um, The Trees Are Blowing in the Wind, and uh, I'd like to put it in the movie. Oh. Oh, I hear the ice cream truck. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was having a stroke. I was hearing music in my head. Um, yeah, I, I want to put your song, oh, that's actually not mine. You would have to say that. You can't lie about that at the point where they want to generate paperwork and license something. You have to disclose that it wasn't your music. So now you look like some sort of skanky person to the music supervisor, and you've just earned yourself a black star. You know, that music supervisor is never going to trust you ever again. Um, and, and probably will say, you know what, we'll take a pass on that piece of music. Then just tell the executive producer, you know what, we had some licensing issues with that one. Can you pick another one? Uh, because they know that if you lied about that or tried to do something sneaky, that you may do something else that's sneaky and get them sued in the process. So they will not take a chance on you. Okay, anything else? I can't believe it's six minutes left. <laughs> Kristen, I know that's not what a stroke is like. Well, <laughs> you would know, sadly. Um, I was actually, uh, Rob Shirelli and I, about 15 years ago, uh, I told you I've got the Eagles, uh, you know, the alternate master of the Eagles um, Take It Easy that I got on two inch 16 track that was found in a dumpster outside of Olympic Studios in London. And I am the proud owner of that. So 10, 15 years ago, whenever it was that I got that, um, a friend of mine who worked at Capitol Studios at the time baked the reel of tape and transferred it to digital for me. And my friend and I, and my friend is also good friends with Rob Shirelli. We've all known each other for a long, long time. Um, we went to Rob's and we were sitting in his control room and we were listening, pulling up the tracks one by one. And all of a sudden, uh, our friend, um, I, I saw his face, just half of his face literally looked like it was wax. It was melting. It's just like all the muscle control. Once I saw it, he just drooped. 
And I said something like, you know, isn't that funny? And he went, uh, uh, literally couldn't respond. And I'd heard that if you think somebody's having a stroke, ask them to raise their hand over their head. So I, I said, can you uh, raise your left hand? And I said, come on, raise your left hand. And he said, I am. I could barely understand, but he said, I am. And so uh, we called the ambulance. The ambulance came. His whole carotid artery had shut down on one side. Luckily, and you may not know this, but if your carotid artery shuts down on one side, the other side will actually feed more blood to your brain. But luckily, he got to the hospital quickly enough, and uh, he is now safe and wonderful, and it's been many, many years since he had that incident. Um, hello, Karen Brasher. Uh, no, music does not have to be uh, the new takeover. Uh, the music does not have to be published as submitted. As a matter of fact, many of the opportunities that you'll get through Taxi will be to get your music signed to a publisher so that they can then license it um, in the industry. So, yeah, you want to be unpublished. If you have a forwarded that has been accepted by a library, do we have to take it off the profile? Um, there are a couple of schools of thought on that. I personally don't think you need to because Taxi is not a site like Spotify or somewhere where the public comes and listens to your music. Um, if it's an exclusive deal, they may want to take it down. Just ask them. Um, you'll find that... Uh, some libraries are uncomfortable with it, others don't, especially if it's, uh, oh, my wife is home. Hi, honey. <laughs> um, you will find that um, non-exclusive publishers are much less concerned about that, in my opinion. <laughs> we have squeaky shoes. Um, we cleaned our floor with something that was apparently different than what we would normally use. And Deb and I both, by the way, do you guys know about the shoes called Blundstones? They've been around for 150 years. They come from Tasmania, but they've been here in the States. I remember seeing them in college and I always thought, those are really cool. I think I should buy some. Um, so Deb and I both have Blundstones and the Blundstones are really squeaky when you walk on this floor. Uh, she's upstairs already walking around, or I would pass along your hello, Ewert. The paramedics ask you to smile and stick out your tongue. <laughs> yeah, our, our friend that had the stroke just completely lost. He had no ability to, like, smile or raise a hand or anything. He was able to spit out, I am. I, I mean, I, I could barely understand him, but he said, I am in a very low, gravelly, foreign sounding voice. One minute to go. Ah. <sighs> so funny i've got one chat room that's kind of on top of the other one so i'm seeing it's funny how things get to one chat room after the other um, there is a little delay uh, so there you go it's five o'clock maybe i'll go a couple minutes long because we started a couple minutes late because of that problem here i'll show you what a blundstone looks like how's that I bought these almost exactly a year ago to the day. Um, the whole point with these is that you try and beat them up. They are very scuffed up and stuff. That's what the soles look like. And I've got to tell you, they are the single most comfortable shoe I have ever worn in my life, bar none. But learning how to put them on, you have to kind of put, your, put them on like this, put your foot in and then twist it. Because trying to get, I've got a D width foot, trying to get it in there is hard, so I turn it sideways and then do it. 
um, Blundstones, B-L-U-N-D-S-T-O-N-E. Um, they've got a Blundstone U.S. website. Uh, I saw them the other day at a saddlery shop, which I heard, which is literally two blocks from our office, and I was in that area, so I heard that these guys sold them. So I went over there to look at them, and uh, they were actually $20 cheaper in the store than they were on the Blundstone website. And they generally run about $179 up to $209 a pair. And they, it, it, I have worn these every single day, every day for a year. <laughs> I've hiked all over Israel in them last year. Um, you can get them wet, you can walk through puddles, you can walk through snow. I've never seen such an indestructible shoe. They're so comfortable that I will even wear them at night sitting on the couch watching TV because the, the um, arch support is great, the insoles, every step you take, it's like somebody's massaging your foot. I cannot tell you how much I love those shoes. Blundstone, B-L-U-N-D-S-T-O-N-E. I know it sounds like Bluntstone. Sounds like something a college kid would buy, right? Uh, the squeak is unfortunate. Yeah, well, it's only squeaky on this wood floor with whatever kind of cleaner we used. Uh, Wow, you don't wear shoes in your house in Hawaii. It's considered very rude. Good to know. Ah, oh, Pearson bought a pair after hearing me talk about them. They feel great. Awesome. Yeah, they are kind of a mix between a cowboy boot and a work boot. Um, the original ones were a brown color, um, and I ne the reason I didn't buy them in all these years, it, they used to only come in one color, and I didn't love that color brown. I just didn't have anything that looked like it would go with it. Then they came out with this kind of, it almost it looks like suede or something, but it's not, and they kind of antique it a little bit. Um, and uh, I love it. I'm actually considering buying a pair in black for those days when I need black shoes. But man, I used to wear sneakers all the time, and now I don't because these are just so good. Shoes in the house track in germs. Uh... Yeah, when COVID first started, uh, I would go to the grocery store and I would come home and I would lice all the bottoms of my shoes. They are sensible shoes. <laughs> they are a little bit like beetle boots. They really are. That's so funny. All you guys are saying, no shoes in the house. Honestly, I go in and out of house, especially, I mean, now during COVID, um, I work a half an hour to an hour and a half at a time, and we have a backyard with a view of the mountain range, and I just go out in the backyard all the time. It's really how I've been able to stay sane, I think, uh, during COVID, is just being able to go out in the backyard. So I'm walking in, walking out. I guess I could walk around the concrete patio in my bare feet, but... I prefer the Blundstones because they make my feet feel so good. I've never said that about a pair of shoes in my lifetime. Um, all right. Well, that's it. Uh, I will see you guys on Thursday right back here. Um, thanks for showing up today. Um, got nothing else to tell you. So have a nice day. Peace out. Thanks for showing up. Great hanging with you and see you Thursday, four o'clock right here. And if you're new and if you, you're not a subscriber, please hit that red subscribe button and give us a thumbs up to show us how much you like us. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>